next talk of the afternoon is from Alok Srinivasta. Um, I think you wrote this with Ellie, right? With Ellie, with Gerson yeah. over there. Um, on deliberate practices for the generation of unnatural kinds and synthetic projects in fields of protein and cell engineering. Welcome. So this is the source of the messy stuff. Right? You guys are like <laughs> classifying and worrying about knowledge representation and here are the people who are kind of adding to the mess. And um, they're being, I mean, so this story I'm offering is that they're being deliberate about it. Um, and um, okay, so I myself uh, got trained as a molecular biologist and a biochemist. So this world is something that I did live in. Um, so I'm gonna just start with the old chemist's view of what nature offers. And I'm just putting two different views of this. One is Mendeleev's and the other is Polanyi. And Mendeleev makes a really nice point that's important to me that you know, he, he wants to say the chemistry should be put alongside mechanics, that any description that you have is really just a point in time. It's a, it like treats matter as a system of ponderable points having scarcely any individuality, which you guys recognize, right? I mean, the talk before just you know, showed how mercurial any individuality that you could assign to a structure was gonna be. And so everything is in a state of mobile equilibrium. So, so for chemistry, matter is an entire world of life with an infinite variety of individuality, both in elements and in their combination. So that's the reality that he saw. And the other part is the operational part that it's in the lab that stuff happens. Chemistry answers questions regarding the interactions of more or less stable substances, but these questions cannot be answered without getting your hands dirty. Experience of these substances and the practical conditions in which they are to be handled. He was, uh, he put surfaces. He put together the, uh, sorry, did you ask him, was he a theorist or was he? Yep. Okay, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm just putting some of my points, my abstract points up front, but mainly I'm trying to use this sort of weird term that unnatural kinds of unnatural making histories, the, the stuff that was made, you know, didn't get made in nature without our intervention. And then, you know, whereas natural kinds I mean, philosophers might you know, try to disagree with me, but natural kinds of natural making histories. And then I'm telling this story mainly f through the lab work of chemists, biochemists, and cell biologists. They, so in my description, they make and remake these making histories the, of how get their stuff gets made. And they routinely work out, I mean, this is the point that these are deliberate activities. They routinely work out the work that they would need to do to you know, generate synthetic histories. Um, <clears throat> and and this, this capacity, you can basically, once you watch it, you can describe that they're also always trying to take that capacity into places that the classification systems haven't begun to work on yet. Right? Um, so this is a portrait of the composition of Right, that this is the very natural ma making history. This is the distribution of different elements in the sun, in the cosmos. And of course we know that's, that has its very natural making history. <coughs> okay. So I'm, that's, I'm just, I introduced this just to introduce the weird way in which I'm using this term. So then I'm just talking about catalogs or classifications as works in progress that get disrupted in two different ways. New discoveries force rearrangements on them. And the other one is what I'm gonna to try to talk about that synthetic sciences like chemistry and engineering routinely extend and rearrange the catalog. And one of the things that's been happening for the last 200 years is that anytime you do some good theory work, 
that further accelerates the capacity to extend these catalogs. And so this is a framework I'm offering and I'm just combining the two uh, terms, the two, two sentences. The, you know, the lab work is what drives the ability to make different making histories, but then the, the mercurial points, the, the structures that seem to come as a cluster, which you may have some examples of and which you can synthesize later, are, especially in organic chemistry, there's this term called structure activity relationships. They define the chemical space, and at that point, you know, your particular chemical can be a chemical or it can look like a member of a species or you know, a member of a continuum. And in fact, this is the kind of stuff that Polanyi did his theorizing on, right? And this lets you have some uh, relationship to how you go around classifying these um, things that are being generated. But what I'm trying to emphasize is that all of this beautiful stuff here and here, which counts as knowledge or, or relationships of things, gets done by you know, trying to make stuff. And so I have some basic examples to just walk through what is it that chemists or biochemists or biologists are doing here. So chemists remake the natural stuff or other stuffs just to characterize and use them. So in that process, they're doing various kinds of synthetic generation histories, right? But they do it with bookkeeping. They keep count of the composition. They keep account of what went in, whether it was purified material, how, and that kind of thing. So one historical example that you can just take is just classic metallurgy and its, I guess, 10,000 year history where you had substances that could be count as a count, that would count as a natural kind. But then when you heat it up enough to get all the other stuff oxidized out and you get clean pig iron, that's an unnatural kind. It's, it's a human intervention product. And then of course the carbon steel. So if you just take those kind of different ways of, of making or uh, acquiring something with its generation history, so just a basic set, you know, collection would be a natural kind. Extraction of purification, here there's some amount of intervention. The thing that chemists know about a lot is syn synthesizing a natural product, but from pure components. So it has some, something that you had characterized before, but you're now making it through a completely unnatural synthetic process. And then you go about synthesizing variants which were not part of the uh, collection out there in nature. So for chemists and, and sorry, more for biochemists and biologists, um, this is sort of a string that, of their operations that you can recognize that, okay, initially for a natural kind, they might first remake it. That capacity to remake it gives them the capacity to recombine it. And that lets them see some things which then they can redesign and develop a larger body of design rules. I mean, we see that with organic chemistry pretty uh, extensively. And uh, for the biochemist with big uh, complex assemblies, it's resolve, reconstitute, and a similar chain follows. But, but these are the different types of capacities for making or for remaking the histories of the things that you play with. And this is a, I mean, just to again walk through that step in the example of rubber to neoprene. So rubber from South American rubber trees arrived in Europe. Turns out it was Priestley who labeled it as something that can rub away pencil marks on paper and hence rubber. Um, then heating the latex while you're turning it into sheets, helping it become harder. That got invent, patented by you know, Goodyear for one person. But um, Otto Wallach, who trained with Kekulé, is the one who figured out 
terpene chemistry. Terpene chemistry, you know, based on several plant substances uh, having these compositions, multiples of C5H8, which turned out to be the isoprene structure and isoprene polymerization. Um, so, and later on, as the seeds from South America were dispersed across the British Empire, you had rubbing, rubber making industry. This is your natural product, natural um, material, but um, in Germany they figured out how to make uh, the isoprenes from foil, petrochemicals and in 1930s you had uh, the same process essentially, the same uh, natural process now being made through petrochemical derived uh, isoprenes. And I think this is kind of what I'm saying, what I'm trying to um, rip, repeat out here, that there's a pattern here that once you have earned the capacity, for example, at 1910, once you earn the capacity to do the making of the natural process in, in a lab, now you can redo that process with an unnatural source. And you now have an unnatural making history for the same product. And so here I'm jumping straight into the, a lab that's been working out things in protein structure, protein function. And um, these guys were interested, I mean, so, um, interested in how you've had signal transduction being worked out for about 40 years. You cell molecular physiology involves a, you know, basically a, a small number of proteins carrying out a rather large number of regulatory activities. And so you, people have been describing this in terms of circuitry. You have a small number of components and you have a lot more, larger number of logical uh, programs being carried out. And so that problem, of course, is known by, you know, how do you integrate multiple signals? And through, and so, so anyway, I mean, the point I'm gonna try and make is, okay, you see these kind of papers coming out from this group where they're investigating the natural process. And I'll walk this through in three such um, uh, lists. So this kind of show, they pull out the natural process that's involved and then they end up redesigning it and recombining it. And among different signaling proteins and as the proteins interact, turns out there's a group of proteins, the PDZ domains that have some special features from this point of integration of signals. And while as they figure that out, they are able to show there's a modular logic which they can then start re-engineering. So, I mean, at this point it's worth pausing and saying, well, people who are characterizing new materials are their own curators. They consistently curate, I mean, so, um, and the interesting thing for them was that, so these are just names of common motifs that are involved in signal integration kind of activities. And the curation led them to saying that, the, that there were proteins, human proteins, that had five of these domains, individual, like basically this is the kind of group, which was saying that this particular PDZ domain is versatile in some way to integrate larger variety of signals. So you, they basically diagnosed this group, this particular class of uh, domains as having some versatility at integrating signals. And so this would be a good place to explore engineering um, of these things. And this is again uh, the next step where a natural kind is being just fully described and <clears throat> this particular protein just has four, you can, 
see the modular logic here that the PDZ domains are able to combine different interactions to be a cargo carrying device. So this is an act neuronal cell body, microtubule, and there are vesicles that are depositing the receptors at the axon tip. And it's this complex that when assembled is able to carry out that activity. And in subsequent work, and they were able to decompose the logic of integration of signals. And I won't go through these details here, but this schema is just pointing out that two different inputs through the integrating uh, protein lets a particular process go forward. And there is, at a conceptual level, there's a similar logic between these two uh, systems. And so this is the abstraction of uh, structure and function being developed here. And so, so in the rhythm of um, I mean, basically, they're at that point where they can see a certain structure, activity, set of relationships, which they can now explore creating um, variants of, right? And um, these are the subsequent papers that just describe how they went, started rewiring the cell signaling pathways. And <clears throat> This is a natural situation where there was an internal control by the modules for and what this is kind of showing is, okay, when in the absence of the ligands, this protein system is off, its downstream activity is off, and in the presence of the ligands, this out, out downstream activity is on. But you can replace some of these with other modules and then use the modularity to construct a new kind of signal integration. And this is uh, an illustration of their work, which lets me show you about how you can re recombine a variety of situations and explore a larger set of possibilities. I mean, you could say that this is an early stage of sort of doing the same thing that got done with terpene chemistry in you know, the 1870s, which is once you figured out the logic, you started building all sorts of polymerization processes. And the idea here was, can we integrate two inputs into an output by making the two inputs conditional? And so this particular activity, activity was being made conditional on two different components. And what, so there's you know, different sets of experiments here, but the X and Y components are diff different rearrangements, different types of modules being explored. And some other things are the linker lengths, so the protein domains, their separation. I mean, this is all, again, just recombining, rearranging, synthesizing in order to explore structure activity space. And this column kind of shows you the activity part of it. What it is showing you is when the various signals capacities are present, are they being additive or are they being, you know, it's a single input. I mean, how does it behave like a circuit? So I'm not, I'm not walking you through it, but this is the activity output of these different arrangements. And, and so what I'm basically trying to present is that having figured out how these things work, they've generated these new combinations to explore and expand the structure activity space available to, that was available before they began making unnatural kinds here. And at this point, as they have further elaborated this work, they are now able to present the logic of, I mean, this would be the equivalent of the logic of organic synthesis or um, polymerization synthesis. I'm just not going to go through it, but they're just pointing out the capacity for redesigning. And as they've gone forward, some of the 
things that have come out of this is that you could extend even the primary, mod uh, primary modular structures that, you, that were offered from primary natural uh, constructs. So some of the things they're now developed is saying we can add up three inputs. So uh, the a concept called scaffolds for, I guess this would be like, um, complexifying the circuitry by adding a more longer module. And I'm just taking the story forward and just pointing out that and here I'm not adding, actually gonna show you anything. It's just that they have gone forward and been um, modifying a larger variety of signaling circuits. Excuse me, when they started this work was that their intention was to create unnatural uh, control of, of these process or did it, did it evolve as each step of the experiments uh, went on? Did they know where they were going? Yeah, so that's, that's um, yes, so um, and so the focus on a natural case where integration of multiple signals was taking place and decomposing that right. was with the intention of figuring out how we could generalize this. And, and very early observation was with this aspect that these proteins had the capacity to respond to multiple entities. And one of the interesting things that gave them confidence in that was that these PDZ domains had two different ways of interacting with other proteins. The same kind of domain can interact with the uh, C-terminal of the protein or with internal structures which mimic the C-terminal. And, and that's why this, that there was a unique set of human proteins that had a large number of these domains was why the zero reactions, <coughs> but there would be versatility of signal integration in the system. So that's, um, between 98 and 2000 uh, was, that was programmatic for them. And, uh, you know, and once they were able to see this, they wanted to figure out how you could generalize this and port different signaling systems on it. And that's sort of the, the progression that they've been able to achieve. And so they've continued to sort of expand the number and types, just like organic chemistry yeah. in the 1870s, that, that the catalog of components you can use and the catalog of reactions that you can generate are being elaborated out because you've got now the capacity to work out different synthetic histories. So um, maybe I'm that just a return to my primary themes that you know the, that it's about having generating new histories in the lab which you can reproducibly um, offer uh, and um, yeah I'm just <laughs> repeating what I've I said at the beginning so this this is the, you know, I, I end with this point that and, yeah, the main thing I wanted to convey is that the capacity to make and remake the making histories is what lets people generate these unnatural kinds, at least in these group of people. These are the people I'd like to thank. Um, Jim Griesemer, Jason Oaks, they're Griesemer and Milstein groups at UC Davis, who have been uh, hosting me for some time. 
and then it's my wife, and there's Ellie. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks so much. the the idea The idea of the making history, I think, is super, super interesting, and it and I feel like it's really going to be a helpful concept for us to think with here. Um, a lot of ideas about that, but just to to throw one out there, mm -hmm. um, it seemed like there were a couple different um, kinds of making history. Mm -hmm. um, that came up in your talk. Um, in particular, uh, in your first or one of your first examples that you threw out there, uh, the example of metallurgy. Yeah. Um, it it seemed like it, there was a kind of transformative process. You find iron ore in the ground and then transform it into through human arts into another form, smelting iron, and then through other processes into another form, carbon steel. So it's this sort of transformative process. Um, in your other two examples, um, well, in, in your final example, mm -hmm. uh, it, that, that seemed to be very clearly a kind of analytical synthetic yeah. process. Take this apart and put it back together. Um, and that was, uh, to a certain extent, seemed to be true, at least of the laboratory side of the synthetic rubber process. Although now that I think of it, it's almost like there was in the laboratory, there was analytical and then synthetic work going on. But then there was also this industrial story of, um, of vulcanization um, and then of more broad scale production of rubber from natural sources that might be more following that, that transformative uh, trajectory. Um, and, uh, and then maybe in the example of synthetic organic chemistry and coming up with new reactions in the course of doing a natural product synthesis or something, that's almost a, a third sort of, um, you know, like a spin-off kind of mm -hmm. making history. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, do you do you have thoughts on you know which of these uh, sorts of histories kind of come up in different circumstances and what are the yeah. factors that shape that? Right. So so so, uh, for me the, yeah. The smelting of iron, we recognize it sort of like okay, blacksmiths could be doing it. Or that's pre-industrial and then post-industrial, you have bigger furnaces and you can, the observations during those processes would lead you, lead you to play around with variations quite differently. Now, do we make a, do we, is there, what kind of distinction do you need to make between industrial making of new histories and small labs making of new histories. And I think that gets pushed uh, strongly when you take the situation of rubber because the rubber situation is happening during the proliferation of the scientific age as well as the industrial age. And the natural rubber, vulcanization of rubber is happening in the industry side, whereas it's Kekulé's graduate student who's figuring out that plant materials when they're categorized, characterized in their composition may seem to have this common chemical structure, it develops terpene chemistry, one subclass of terpene chemistry is isoprene chemistry. That becomes a well characterized mechanism for polymerization. That lets the Germans invent a synthetic part, which when the First World War comes around and affects the accessibility to rubber incentivizes people to use petrochemicals as a source. So the, there is a, I mean, I think this is probably also very relevant to this transition into nanomaterials that the making that is fueling nanomaterials comes from industrial processes, powder metallurgy, dispersion processes, you know, um, vapor deposition technologies, which is, which semiconductor industry has learned to make things and, and set up say, basically gigantic kitchens for making things that a lab wouldn't consider, right? So, so there are two kinds of makings because the kitchens and their equipment are different. And um, so, but both are 
making and and remaking of making and and you know so when you sorry i should just go back to this i think an industry house like a fab for a semiconductor plant you know would be does all of these things and it just does it with different tools with different materials i mean just the semiconductor silicon wafer going from a 1 inch to 8 inch involves all of these things and so at one level they are the same thing but then there's qualitative differences which have a big uh, role to play here and um i think i'm partially answering your question yeah, well we can i'll i'll follow up but i want to get more let more questions it, it just, I, this this maps i always use the term independent variables and understanding what the independent variables are and then you demonstrate your understanding by controlling you know you know doing something different but being able to predict it so if this is you know if this structure causes this and if i change the structure that way i can predict the result and by gosh i got it and it i you're coming at it from an entirely different terminology uh but i i think it maps you know one to one ex exactly on that because this is really what the science, to my mind, the scientific process is. You see a phenomena, you try to figure out what makes it work, and when you figure out what makes it work, the proof of that pudding is by controlling and predicting what, what you would do when you change what makes it work. So I mean, one of the important things about that is that right, when you look at it from organic chemistry perspective, people making and breaking bonds, whether it's Linus Pauling or you know other people, they recognize in this some kind of what what some scientists would call mechanism, mechanism of electron transfer, bond formation. G. M. Lewis will draw you the bond things, right? But if you go into a semiconductor fab in the 70s and you say, why is my yield on my you know, silicon wafer down by 70%, why am I getting too many cracks? And you take that, that wafer gets looked at by the microscope, under the microscope, you basically at this place have a statistical table, yeah. right? You have a process characterization table. Yes. And then using that table, you again control the variables. You do not have mechanism. Right. You do not have mechanism. You do not have a predictive root model of what's going on and you get to a four inch wafer using those tables. But eventually, people will figure out sure. what, what's the science behind those tables. Sure, and I'm a partisan. A lot of work has gone into that over the Yeah, years. so I'm being a partisan of, you know, the, the cooks making the new making histories, yeah. move from two inch to four inch, and somebody else can write the story about, you know, because now they're moved on from cooking four inch to six inch, and it produces a whole different set of problems. And again, at this place, you have tables, right? You do not have mechanistic models. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, just a real general version of some of these questions. So the unnatural histories are really interesting, but I'm kind of trying to figure out um, how, to, how to characterize the difference between those and, and natural histories in a way that does some work. So if I was an alien looking at Earth saying, here are these organisms that are really good at catalyzing these you know, reactions, for instance. But, but I, could, I could catalyze it. I, I mean, I could characterize the reactions as kinds. What's the difference between that and the Big Bang nucleosynthesis making lithium or something? I mean, is there some difference that I can really latch on to that characterizes that difference? Um. Can I take a stab at that one? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you a little bit of time to think about your answer. Um, so when we're doing philosophy of science, we're doing philosophy of people science, not philosophy of aliens looking down on earth science. And I think part of, part of what's intrinsically interesting about this natural, unnatural distinction, the way that we're treating it in this workshop, is that um, when we think about unnatural kinds in the way that Alok is suggesting, and I love, I love this way of thinking about it, um, it's picking out the kinds of practices that are done by the people who are also characterizing the science, that the, that the identity of the, the people doing it, or the, you know, the entities doing it, the, 
brains in a vat doing it. It's the same brain in a vat or brain in a body or brain in a meat bag um, that is that's generating the making history activity and generating the the characterization activity. Is, is the result anything that like a traditional philosophical thing like an essentialist? Well, well so if you're, if you're an alien looking down on uh, people smelting ore and the Big Bang, um, you, there's no guarantee that you're going to have the sort of cognition system that's going to recognize those as alike in any way, or as alike in any of the relevant ways that we're going to recognize them as. I mean, this is, this is the sort of foundational view of philosophy of science in practice, is that science is a human practice, and what we're doing when we're characterizing scientific activity is characterizing the actual scientific activity, not, you know, sort of hypothetical Vienna circle science as the ultimate uh, empiricization of first order logic, um, but, but the actual practices of science that human beings do with all of those messy constraints and all of the uh, uniquely human advantages and disadvantages. There's, there's another sort of funny way of answering that question. So, uh, you know, about Carl Sagan's blue dot, that somebody out there looking here would say, there's this planetary object that's got a spectrum, a light spectrum that violates mm -hmm. thermodynamic equilibrium. If they were able to have a better spectrometer and actually analyze stuff, they might notice that there are some bars, chemical bars in coming off from the atmosphere of Earth that would not compare well with another planet that only had biological evolution and no human cultural evolution. There are constituents in matter that are even farther away from uh, chemical equilibrium than an unhindered biological suit. Yeah, but I'm also emphasizing something that we, this is not unnatural in the sense that we're not making silicon behave like, you know, uranium, right? I mean, it continues to be an elaboration of Mendeleev's periodic table that, you know, you would not have known if the chemists hadn't been cooking right alongside the, you know, biologists characterizing what biology has been cooking. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is a this is kind of a continuation of the methodological kind of implications mm -hmm. here. But I you presented this sort of sequence of remake, recombine, redesign, and then design rules. Mm -hmm. And I was oh, design rules. That seems to be something you don't see in in biology in the sense that it's usually that those are meant in other in other fields. And you mentioned earlier there's this move toward how do we generalize. There's the, gen there's the traditional way of generalizing with a general law. But as far as I know, and maybe, maybe Lim's work has, has gone in this direction, but as far as I know, there's nothing that looks like that that's come out of experimental biological research. You have all the steps that you were describing sounded, sounded exactly right in this making history picture. But then I, I sort of balked a little bit at the, the design rules, maybe in some sciences, maybe not in others. But I started to wonder in the, in the earlier discussion, mm -hmm. there's this notion of mechanism. There's a sense in which you're putting, you're dealing with parts always. So there's some way that these accounts are mechanistic. You're recombining things. There's, some, there's something like a mechanism going on if you're using this method, but it may not always be predictive. We may not always get to the point of being able to predict what's going to happen when we put things together. I mean, that's, that's the usual pattern in biology is you, you just have to try it and see how yeah. it's going to happen when you put these components together. You actually don't have rules that predict from basic components. Right, yeah, currently, we could be working toward that, but it, as far as I know, it hasn't emerged. So I'm wondering if there's the making history framework actually seems like it allows for this reflexive sort of um, rethinking of these different methodological components too. Yeah, so let me it has let this feature and we can talk about principles and prediction and mechanisms in a way that mm -hmm. maybe is looser or more variable. We can recombine those methodological components in this framework. So let me push my point a little further because I kind of 
this is a little radical enough for me that I kind of ate my own words. Um, but if you just focus on this example of Robert Neoprene, and by design rules, I'm going to continue with design rules towards cooking new stuff, right? Cooking new histories. And so while Wallach, Wallach figured out the isoprene rule for, as the natural thing that's happening in latex, one of the things that when you're doing terpene chemistry is you add a branch point here and you dope these, I mean, because what you're seeing is a polymer that's a linear polymer. You shouldn't, you shouldn't get very stable sheets using this. And what they, be, what, so once you've got this cooking capacity within you, you dope isoprene one to, you know, one is to five with an additional agent that allows for cross links. Now you've got design rules for a, a, a polymer, you know, varying the strength and the lateral uh, elasticity. So you've got design rules for making elastomers of different properties. Now just keep keep thinking that way. That's how you're thinking of design rule. That's helpful because so, that wasn't my assumption. So it's some sort of like high level schematic for a synthetic protocol. And out, an input out, a robust input output relation that you put into that. Intelligent. Yeah. It's it's kind of you're going towards saying that the the catalog of naturally occurring parts, combinations, and holes at each of those levels can be exceeded. Mm. <coughs> but, so uh, this is coming from someone who's very ignorant about the underlying science of this. Yeah. But I, what I get from uh, sorry, I think question Carl from Carl's point <laughs> is that uh, if human agency is the difference between natural and unnatural, <coughs> human agency is involved in both. So what really is the difference? <coughs> because I. Without human agency, you wouldn't even have the thing we describe as natural, as natural kind. So, so here's an example of that, right? The, the critics of Lavoisier and Lavoisier's new chemistry said, what are you doing telling us that you've gotten all of these super expensive high-tech equipment available to the P Paris Academy and stuck these samples under all of this and come out with this stuff? And you're telling us that? Is the elemental, you know, basic building block? You put more human work into producing that than any of the rest of us, you know, could, could possibly dream of doing. Yeah. I, so, I don't think I'm, I think I'm describing difference between activities of human agency. Right. I think there's no argument that we wouldn't be having all these conversations without human agency. No, but that's not, that's not, uh, it's, it's a, in many, I think I'm basically trying to describe an engine in human agency that can produce differential effects. Right, so let me give an example of something I'm actually comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, IPS cells induce pluripotent stem cells. Mm -hmm. uh, you take an adult cell, mm -hmm. you introduce uh, genetic factors mm -hmm. that are also natural in a sense introduce genetic factors into it. So it's all natural materials that you're using. No, 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 but no, no, it's I'm, I'm, different I'm, I'm, than evolution. I'm what evolution do, does it naturally, let me do, let me, human stone. Well, let me just, yeah, yeah. Carry let me example. just get to the end of my point. So you, you yeah. do that. I, I'm not arguing one word the other, I'm just yeah. trying to understand it. You do that and that returns it uh, to a pluripotent state. Mm -hmm. Is that synthetic or natural? Uh, I mean, I, is that a new kind that's synthetic? Is it right. unnatural or is it natural? I'm just trying to... So th this, would be, this would be a very similar point to the question Carl pointed out, of, of which I invoked Carl Sagan's thing, right? A thermodynamically improbable state is not a scientifically impossible state, okay. right? Yes, a pluripotent cell's biological behavior is entirely consistent with the mechanisms of biology that evolution has brought to this point, but the availability of an IPS cell for certain medical purposes is in that sense 
an unnatural, it has an unnatural history. So it's a definition in essence that corresponds to a way of thinking, to a certain bias, not necessarily one that's true, but it's just a definition. For all intents and purposes, it's a definition. You've defined it as something which is a construct, if you will, that's a better term to you. Um, so I, saying IPSL is unnatural is simply a construct. It is not the truth, it's just... It has, it's a yes, but, but of course, I mean, of course, it's a construct, you know, just like, you know, talking about natural kinds is a construct. And the, the, the thing that I'm working out here is not that whether it's a construct or not, but the differential consequences of this construct versus other constructs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're absolutely right. And I mean, um, that what I'm trying to bring up here is that Lavoisier using these massive, you know, glass instruments figured out how to cook in a predictable manner with components of matter that hadn't been cataloged before. And, you know, thanks to the industrial age, that ability to cook in new ways came down in cost, became more ubiquitously available, and we are cooking many, many more things. Of course, it's a construct, but it's a construct that has a propagating, proliferating, diversifying set of consequences. Right. I mean, the reason I ask is that scientists usually, like, uh, you know, I've been to events where scientists will argue that lawyers trying to impose a definition that makes <laughs> absolutely no sense, no. right? Uh, and if we're dealing with constructs, lawyers work with a different framework in terms of what, the kinds of things that they think about to build their own constructs. So if they're all constructs, it's just a question of which one gains dominance in any particular situation. And and, uh, that's the reason I was asking. Yeah, but, but, but the place where you're going is terribly important to me, right? Of course, it's a construct, but a construct that carries a certain convention, a cons something that you know, I go into a chemistry lab and I take the name of the construct and the person there is, oh, you want that? You can use the chemical hood. We've got the reagents. The construct lets me cook in his kitchen, right? Now, the problem is I go with that same construct and I walk into a semiconductor lab and I start, and he's like, what are you babbling about? Construct fails, right? Because the con context fails. And the constructs have capacities. The capacities are portable, though situated. And that's, ex I mean, so that Lavoisier needed the French king to help him construct the constructs that let us have isoprene. That's a pretty dramatic <laughs> set of moments. But we got to work out the mechanism of the efficacy of those constructs. I, I think there's also a question of intent. And to me, intent has a, a big role in differentiating between natural and, and evolutionary changes that are out of human control and the kinds of, of change that, that humans are trying to do intentionally. And I, and I think it, you were on that border. I don't. I, are we having a talk on synthetic biology in, in this meeting? Um, I'm going to do something. Yeah. No, I'm not at all. But uh, <laughs> I like. You're going to touch. But it. I'm going to talk about stuff that's directly relevant to this. And it's actually cool that you mentioned this because yeah. this is. It's exactly about this. I think the mm. the big thing here that's actually pretty important is you know take something like the fact that perception isn't just passive. It's yeah. action oriented or pattern oriented. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you're no longer dealing with just, you know, passive observation. Right. You're dealing with intervention right. of a different kind. You're not manipulating stuff in the lab, but you are in a sense manipulating um, something. something. So, you know, when you're observing an animal population in a tree yeah. versus you uh, put them in captivity and yeah. you observe right. them in a zoo, um, perhaps those are two different types of intervention that are going on, but you would say the first one is is just natural You know, you're just watching <coughs> animals in a natural setting. So maybe the Distinctions kind of on a continuum. It's not can, a continuum. Can that not be mediated by bias though? Like your, your eyes watching the thing? You're, fair, you're giving off pheromones and yeah, you know, all yeah, sorts they, of stuff's going know. on. Yeah, well, they know well, you're Let me there. have one quick statement because in, in evolution, you know, that was a debate for a hundred years, whether evolution had a goal or not, you know, is it theistic or is it agnostic? And 
So, so I don't, uh, I, I was trying to get someone who does synthetic biology specifically and, uh, someone in particular, not just a person yeah. in the abstract and she wasn't available this week, but, um, uh, her name's Catherine Kendig and, um, I think, are we, are we sending out papers after this? You were talking about that. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking that one. Yeah. It, it so, might be fun to make a good bibliography on yeah. the website. Yeah. Really so like we'll 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 send out some references to our papers, and then when we when we do our yeah. sort of yeah. collected yeah. volume well, from this, uh, she wants to contribute to that. Good though. It's very interesting. I just had a really quick uh, riff on the the intent, the natural and natural. Maybe there's a way to draw a methodological distinction. It's not not the exhaustive thing, but it's. Taking the Lavoisier example, it's like it's a criticism if you're doing a natural study to say that it only shows up in the lab. If the oxygen was only something he produced in the lab mm. and not something that could be assumed to be found in other contexts and generalized yeah. in that sense, for a natural, if the study is of natural things, it's a criticism to say, hey, you did this with your special tools and it only is there. Not at all a criticism, and if you're building something new. Are they unnatural stuff? Like, yeah, great. Yeah. And now we'll export it. <laughs> and and that's like, that the IPS cells are, are along those lines. The fact that they don't occur on their own, on their maybe own. ever, maybe yeah. they do. There's a lot of debate about what self potential right. might be, right. which I guess that's my thought. But so that, it wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't be an exhaustive way of, of, of capturing that distinction, the natural yeah. and natural. But it's one way, and it, it heads to that point about intent. So there's a kind of criticism that would, that would, dig in an incisive criticism yeah. for natural projects that does not hold for unnatural ones you could at least use to make the distinction in some cases. I mean, on that point, the thing that always comes to me is that this portrait of the composition of the universe would not be possible without those artificial things being done in Lavoisier's lab and that whole regime, because you would not know how to recognize a spectral line of a purified element because you're going to say they're only in the lab, that would be a problem. You're right, but without the ability to cook the purified element in the lab and then characterize it, you would not be able to recognize, you wouldn't have the knowledge. Okay, thank you. <laughs>